Hey, no, I am honored to be here. I'm glad Daniel introduced me because I was just going to get up and say, hey, look, I'm Pastor Carl Nichols. If you're new with this, I just hit a growth spurt. So like, here I am. <laughs> Somebody said, that was mean. If you, if you guys knew what Carl has said to me over the last 10 years of our relationship, he deserves it. I'm just saying, I'm just kidding. No, I do want to take a second, though, and honor Pastor Carl and Julie, Jace, Trey, they are our family. They really have been just an encouragement. We launched Generation Church 10 years ago, March 4th, 10th, 2012. We just celebrated 10 years. And uh, yeah, yeah, we can celebrate that. And uh, so we've been just following in the footsteps and uh, partnering with Relevant for a long time. This is actually my first time preaching in this building, but I've preached several times in the, in the old building. But I'm just honored to be here, and I just want you guys to know you have a pastor that truly cares for people, him and Julie, and we all know that Julie is the one who makes that relationship the best, and, uh, but uh, they have been, they've walked through us through some really dark times, and they've walked through us through some of our times of celebration, so I just want to take a second and honor your pastor, Carl, and uh, Julie today, yeah. So, but excited to be here. I'm also honored to have my family here, my beautiful wife, Jessica, uh, my daughter, Maya, and my oldest daughter, Lana. Uh, she just turned 16 and is now driving, so pray for your boy. And then uh, I have a seven-year-old son who is currently probably tearing down your kids' ministry, so y'all pray for them over there. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Can I ask you to do something for me to make me feel at home? Is that okay? Uh, how many of you guys love the Bible? You guys love the Bible around here? I'm going to preach from it. I'm going to preach from it anyways, whether you like it or not. Um, that's why we're here, right? Uh, so I would just ask that you stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. We're going to be in Psalm 84. If you have a physical Bible, you can turn there. If not, we have the great Bible in the sky. So if you wouldn't mind, just stand as I read the Scripture. Uh, we do this at my church. We just stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. And then we'll be seated and we'll jump into the sermon today. Uh, so we're in this series called The Summer of Psalms. And, uh, and so we're going to be in Psalm 84. And we're going to start with verse 1. It says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body, and soul, I will shout. Somebody say shout. shout. Joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home. And the swallow builds her nest and raises her young at a place near your altar. Now, I want to take a time out right there and tell you the significance of that verse. Because if you know anything about sparrows or um, if you know anything about the swallow, like they were, the sparrow was an insignificant bird in that culture. And the swallow, if you've ever seen a swallow, it can't be still. It's restless. And what a beautiful picture that they find a home at the altar of God. And I want you to know maybe you're here today and you feel like your life has been insignificant or you feel like you cannot find rest for your soul. There is a place in the presence of God for you today. And this is what he goes on to say. O Lord of heaven's armies, my king to my God and my God, what joy for those who can live in your house always singing your praises. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. We'll talk about that a little later. When they walk through the valley of weeping, check this out, it will become a place of refreshing springs. How many of you know that sounds contradictory? How can I walk through a valley of weeping yet experience refreshing? And it says the autumn rains will clothe it with blessings. They will continue to grow stronger, and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. O oh Lord God of heaven's armies. Hear my prayer. Listen, O God of Jacob. O God, look with favor upon the king. Our shield show favor to the one you have anointed. And I love verse 10. So powerful. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. O Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. Can we all say amen to that? Amen. You may be seated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great word, great word. Um, so we're in this series called the Summer of Psalms. We're walking through different psalms. There's something powerful about this psalm. I want to give you some context and some background. Because today we're going to be talking about this subject, a heart for the house. 
a heart for the house. Psalm 84 is known as the Pearl of Psalms. It's actually one of those psalms that it's, it's actually written to go side by side with Psalm 23. Some of you, that might be the only psalm you've ever read in your life. You hear it at every funeral or every, maybe that's the psalm you've got it on a bumper sticker. Anybody ever heard of Psalm 23? Lord is my shepherd, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so Psalm 84 actually complements Psalm 23. So this is one of those treasures. How many of you know for something to be called the pearl of the psalms, you guys know how pearls are formed? It's actually formed by irritants in an oyster. And as the irritants build up over time, the oyster will actually surround those irritants with this mucus that over time turns into a treasure that people will sell for jewelry. Isn't that ironic? That something that irritated the oyster brings value to us. How many of you know that's exactly what our life in Christ looks like when we walk through valleys of the shadow of death, when we walk through seasons of desperation and, and suffering and, and anxiety, that meant over time God takes those irritants in our soul and turns it into our greatest pearl of worship. And, and so don't miss this. This is a powerful psalm, but you got to understand why it was written, who it was written from, and who it was written for. It was written for the descendants of the Korahites. The Korahites. Now, to understand who Korah was, Korah was a man who led a rebellion against Moses. He gathered up 250 people and rebelled against Moses in the wilderness, and God wasn't too happy about that, so all of them died. But God, in his grace, actually allowed Korah's sons to live. Now, the Korahites were actually descendants of Levi, the descendants of the Levites. Why does that matter? Because the Levites and the children of Israel were actually giving the responsibility of all things in the temple, all things priestly related or worship related. So if you were a part of the Levite family or the Korite family, that means your job, if you had sons, whoever, your job growing up, you already knew that your job was to serve in the temple of God. And so these sons went on to serve King David. They actually were responsible for some of the musical things that went on during the, the worship. And so they were actually the first worship leaders. Now, over time, we all know, because you know your Bible, I don't have to tell you all this stuff. You guys know all this stuff. But Solomon, the son of David, was the first one to actually build a physical temple where God was, be, was to be worshipped by Israel. And in that temple, the Korahites then became what was known as the doorkeepers or the gatekeepers. We just read about that in Psalm 84, right? So what does that mean? That meant they guarded the gates of the temple. They were responsible for making sure that all impure things stayed out of the temple. And they took care of the grounds. They took care of every aspect of the temple. So not only did they lead in times of worship, but they cared about the entire house. They kept it clean. So they were worship leaders and janitors. Just a little side note for all you worship leaders out there. But how many of you know when you have a heart for the house, you don't just care about your job, you care about all of it. And so here they had a heart for the house. Now, here's what's powerful about this is that sometimes we can't relate to the Psalms. In fact, most of us probably start reading Psalms and we're like, I can't relate to this. And the reason why is because can I tell you that a lot of us take for granted that you have a place that you either get to choose with your own freedom to come and worship and gather together. Or if you don't like that, guess what? You can just stay home and click it on your TV or on your phone. There's really no sense of anticipation or, or excitement or expectation when you come to the house of God. You know why? Because these people were writing from a place of desperation suffering and exile. Do you know what exile means? Like we don't know what that means, most of us. So to be exiled means that they had armies that would come in, they would take over their nation, take all of their sons and daughters, the ones who were, they, they would kill a lot of them and then use the other sons as slaves and use the daughters for, for prostitution or for marrying into their to their own kingdom, and they would take them to a foreign land. So imagine somebody coming into the Atlanta area, coming into your home and saying, you can no longer live here. And you no longer get to choose where you go to church. You no longer get to choose where you work. We're going to take you to a distant, far, foreign, God-awful place where you're going to experience suffering. So imagine being taken from your home in Atlanta and being taken to Alabama. Like I mean, just think about like that. <laughs> Do y'all have Alabama fans here too? Man, we got them in our church. They're like mosquitoes. We can't get rid of them. It's crazy. But like, 
Now, we're grateful for all people from all walks of life, even people who are far from God. So we're glad you're here. Um, I, I, anytime I preach about Alabama and our church, I always hear those two god-awful words. That's, that's, the only thing they know how, that's the only two words they know in the Alabama dictionary, right? I'm not going to say them because I'm a Tennessee fan, so I can't even talk about that here. I know you guys are champions and all that kind of stuff. That's great. Roll tears. Go Georgia. All that kind of stuff. All I can say is Josh Dobbs, Jawan Jennings. That's the one thing that I will hold on to for all you college football fans. That's right. Hail Mary. But anyways, so listen, back to the Bible. You guys are distracting me. Now listen, so we can't comprehend this because we take for granted that you can have a choice to drive down the road to really probably within several miles of anywhere that you live and find a church to go in and worship. They had been exiled. Everything about what they are writing is an expectation and anticipation to get back to the house of God that they had been exiled from. It was not a choice. They, they wrote about, man, what it was going to be like. They wrote about, man, this is the only place that I want to be in. Can I tell you, when we read about the Psalms, the reason why it's hard for us to correlate too is because today, can I be really transparent and honest? We've made worship about us. Our favorite songs, our preference of music, and can I be really, really transparent? Like, we love the worship songs that surround, that talk about us. How much God loves me. And nothing necessarily wrong with that, but can I tell you, when the psalmist wrote about their experiences, they wrote from a place of, like, how amazing God was, not how awesome we are. And can I tell you, most of us come to church to get something from God. And we worship in order to get something from God. In fact, some of you probably came this morning to kind of counterbalance what you did last night. You're like, last night I was getting toe up from the flow up. This morning I'm going to come get my worship on. And guys, that's going to cancel out. You know, last night I got my torque on. This morning I got my hand raised. You know, whatever. <laughs> but I want you to understand, worship is not for a response, but it's in response. That was the difference. They understood that my worship has nothing to do with what God can do for me, but it has everything to do with who God already is. And can I tell you why they found themselves in this place in the first place? It's because Israel, not like us, I mean, just imagine, imagine them, not you, because we don't experience this. They never handled blessing well. In fact, every time they experienced blessing, guess what they did? They stepped back into idolatry and comfort and apathy. And guess what would happen? God would turn them over to other nations. Then they would go like, oh, you know what? It really wasn't that bad when we were serving God. Let's pray that he would come back and restore. And then he would restore things. He would send a deliverer. They'd be like, yay, we love Jesus again. Until they got comfortable and apathetic again. And then he would turn them back over because they would forget that, man, my life is not about what God can do for me. But it's about the fact that I serve a God who, yes, in his grace and in his mercy, he chose to send his son to cover my sin debt. But outside of that, I am not entitled to anything else. I'm not. And that's hard for us to comprehend because we've made even our faith about us. And so I want you to get this. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write this down. Worship, we don't worship for a response from God in a service. We worship in response to God in our serving. Worship is a lifestyle. It was their lifestyle. It, was who, it wasn't just something they did on Sundays. It was every part of their life. We don't handle blessing well either, do we? In fact, most of us, we correlate worship to just singing or showing up to church, but really we worship something else and someone else. This is just another box we check during the week. I'm your friend, I promise. I'm, I'm going to be encouraging, but I can also go home next week. I'll turn this back over to Carl, and he can come and love on y'all after I get done today. So. But I want you to understand that this, this, this whole having a heart for the house, man, it's this... I can't wait to make worship my lifestyle, not just show up to church once a week. So how do we create a culture of worship in this house? How do we have a heart for this house that God has placed us in? 
And so I believe to cultivate this, we need to focus on three things today. I'm going to talk about three things, and I'm going to get out of your hair. And the first one is we need to focus on God's presence. How many of you know the presence of God is where we are changed? And I think we have made the presence of God and the worship of God common. You know what you do when you make things common? You overlook them. You take them for granted. And you forget to see them for who they are. You know how I know that? Because we do that to everybody who's closest to us, don't we? That's how marriages end up in divorce. That's how families end up. You realize that you treat some of your coworkers better than you treat your spouse sometimes? I mean, not you. Think about people who aren't in here. But think about <laughs> other people. Not you. You guys look like you guys got it, got it going on. Our kids, do you realize that some of you wouldn't talk to your best friend the way you talk to your kids? And it's because we've made them common. And that's what we do to God. Look what he says in Psalm 84, 1 through 2. I love this. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. And check this out. I long, yes, I faint. Everyone say faint. With longing to enter the courts of the Lord with my whole being. Don't miss this. My whole being, everything, body. And soul. Do you realize the body and soul was meant to glorify and worship Jesus? Not just your lips, not just your thoughts. Everything about me was created to glorify and worship Jesus. I will shout. There's that word again. Everyone say shout. Joyfully to the living God. I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me six months ago in January. Are there any deer hunters in here? Anybody? Raise them up high so I don't feel like I'm sharing a story. from. Okay, a few of you. Cool. If you're like, oh my gosh, he kills animals. Just know we eat them too. It's cool. Um, so, so six months ago, January, it was toward the end of our hunting season. And, uh, every year in January, we start out the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. And as a church, we'll talk about like, Hey, there's 21 days. We're going to seek God. We're going to start our year off. Right. And we ask people to, you know, to consider participating in some sort of fast. We'll always start the year with one week of like a full fast. Sometimes it's four or five days of a full fast. If you don't know what a full fast is, it's basically just water and juice, for that time period. Yes, I know Jesus did it for 40. That's why he was Jesus. I'm not Jesus, okay? Uh, but then I would fat, do a different fast after that. Well, I, I go hunting. Well, my problem is, is I'm not smart, and I don't want to hear anything from over here in my family area, okay? My problem is, is like, you know, when you fast like that, you're not supposed to be as active as you normally are because your body's working overtime providing nutrients that you're not giving itself through food or whatever. But I was still going to the gym every day, I'm going hunting or whatever. It's toward the end of hunting season, so I'm trying to get some more. So I'm like depleting my body of nutrients. So we, we go on our last, it's the last hunt of the season, and we get a shot on a deer, and we're trying to track this deer in these woods. Well, the problem is it's down this, when I say deep ravine, I mean this thing is almost straight down to this creek. And I'm with two um, more seasoned men. That means they're old, okay? I'm with older guys. And they're like, so guess who gets to climb down into the ravine? Not, the, not those guys, right? They're riding around on four-wheelers, and your boy's walking. I'm really mad about it. I'm still sour about it. But anyways, I, I, I'm, I'm, my, I'm look, I've got my watch, and it's telling me my heart rate's like at 185. And I'm just walking, y'all. Like, I'm not working out. I'm not doing But, like, that's how hard my heart was working because I was so depleted. And I thought, well, I've got to track this. So I go down into this ravine. And I get there, and guys, I don't have any water. I don't have any, and I am like, I'm soaked from sweating. My heart rate's super high, and I can't find this stupid deer. I'm mad. Well, I get down there and realize it's it's pitch black because it had gotten dark. All I have was my flashlight, no water. I cannot get out of this ravine. Now, you're talking about on an average day, I just walk up the hill. I guess not that big of a deal. I'm so depleted of energy. It took me an hour to crawl out of this ravine. I would have to crawl several places, stop, breathe, crawl back out. When I got home, you can ask my wife, I was so depleted. For the next hour, they were feeding me bananas, mustard, pickle juice, everything you can imagine. My entire body was locked up. I was cr- I- I've never had severe cramps like I had when I did when I came out of that ravine. And I told her that's the closest I ever come to just passing out and fainting from exhaustion. And right there, God told me, 
there were people who could not wait to get in the presence of God like that. He said, I long and I faint. You know what? You realize what it means to faint? It means your brain's not getting enough oxygen, and so you black out. Imagine longing for the presence of God so bad that that's your next breath. You have to breathe him in to even survive. But most of us have made the presence of God common. And so now we take for granted that we get to come to a place where the presence of God is here to worship and acknowledge him. You know, what's amazing is the reason I think we don't hunger and thirst for righteousness or hunger and thirst for the things of God or the presence of God anymore is because most of us show up full. You realize what culture you live in? You live in a culture that wants you to feast on everything. For, for, for every 30 seconds, they want you to feast on something new. You're like, wow, well, you ever like graze through a buffet? You know, and you're just like, oh, I'll take some of that. I'll take some of that. That's what life has become for most of you. And here's the problem. Do you realize that, that companies spend billions of dollars? If you're under the age of 18 in here, I want to speak to you for a second. Spend billions of dollars to make sure they are giving you at least, at least 12 seconds of information to keep you hooked all day long. It's why you have these, these, these social media outlets like TikTok and Instagram that they are just locked into that all day. You know why? Because they have spent billions to make sure they can give you enough material to keep eating on all day. You know, I have to tell my kids sometimes, hey, you can't eat that. What, what do we used to say? We used to say this back in the day. Don't eat that. You're going to ruin your what? You're going to ruin your, you're going to ruin your supper. If you eat all that junk food, you're going to ruin your supper. And what do we do? We are f- so full of junk before we even get to the presence of God. Therefore, we don't want the bread of life. I'm preaching now. I'm preaching now. I'm, I think I got some people over here that might want to hear me preach. But listen, <laughs> I, I want you to hear me today. Can I tell you that the average attention span right now for a human being is 12 seconds? I lost a lot of y'all a long time ago. I'm okay with that. (laughs) Do you realize that a goldfish has a 14-second attention span? (laughs) Guys, a goldfish has a bigger attention span than we do. That's incredible. But this is where we're at. And so we no longer hunger for the presence of God anymore. We don't anticipate. Can I tell you that miracles don't happen just because we hope they do? They happen in anticipation and desperation. That's where miracles are. You realize you can't just show up for church and hope that intimacy with God happens? Here I am. That doesn't work in marriage, by the way. That might be some really good counseling advice for some of y'all. You're wondering, like, what's wrong with our marriage? Because you're just going home going like, oh, I hope that we just stir up some intimacy. Men, it may start with taking out the trash and doing some dishes. I don't know. That's free advice for some of y'all. But how many of you know it don't just happen like this? Okay, I hope. All right. All right. Go ahead. Love on me. Like, <laughs> that don't happen. How many of you know you got to stir up some intimacy? When you come to the presence of God, you've come, you're like, God, I have come desperate and expecting because if, I, if you don't breathe in today, I don't breathe out when I walk out of this place. The problem is we show up to church, and this is the only time we ever sing to God. You know how I know? It's because worship looks really awkward for some of y'all. Whatever happens in here is always a result of what happens behind the scenes. Do you realize that? Can I ask you this question? Are your most powerful worship moments, do they only Your most important worship moments, do they only happen in front of people? Are your most important worship moments only in front of people? I would even challenge the worship band with that. Like sometimes I had to challenge our worship band. I was like, listen, if the only time you ever listen to worship or or worship is when you are singing to people, then that's not, you're not leading worship. You're just singing. You're performing. And some of us, it's the only time we come to pray. It's the only time. And then we wonder why there's no intimacy between you and God. I want to tell you something. It's not because there's hypocrites. It's not because he's not here. It's not because God's not real. It's because you did not come longing for the presence of God. In fact, you came longing for a service so you can get in and get out, and hopefully you check that box in heaven. 
You think when you get to heaven one day, God's going to go, okay, all my, five, all my gold star people over here, because you guys have attendance of 75% attendance or more. Now, all you 30% attendance and less, you guys are over here. You guys get the little bitty single wide mansion. Everybody else gets this because they were in church more. God don't care how many times you show up here if you didn't show up here anticipating his presence. Look at verse 5 and 6 of Psalm 84. This is so good. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord. Where does your strength come from? Who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. Why? How can they have refreshing springs in a valley of, a, a valley of weeping? Because they have set their hearts and their minds on the presence of God, not on their circumstances. <laughs> That's good. I think it's out. It will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessings. You know what a pilgrim is? A pilgrim is somebody who's going on a journey in a land that they were not born in. Can I tell you, when you come to know Christ, this earth is no longer your land. We are now journeying as pilgrims through a place that is not our home, but our actions, our thoughts, our heart, our worship is preparing us for a home that is to come. I'm saying I'm on my way back to the presence. I'm on my way back to the house of God. I'm on my way back to where God wants me to be. And that's why a pilgrim understands, like, man, I may not be there yet, but I'm on my way way man and so what about us are we are we anticipating like a pilgrim the second thing that I think we need to understand and focus on to have a heart for the house is people and when I say people I, I know we say this statement all the time it's a bumper sticker right it's like man the church is not the building it's the people yay and it's funny because we say that but we don't understand that we are the people. You know what I challenge the church with all the time? I'm like, we always say, you ever realize how they are always people that aren't you? What do we tell our kids? Hey, you need to watch out for that. You need to stay away from that bad crowd. They just got involved in the wrong crowd. Nobody ever says, my kid was the wrong crowd. You ever notice that? They just got involved with the wrong crowd. Well, who is the wrong crowd? I need to know. Because every other parent that had their kid in that same crowd said the same thing about your kid. Right? You ever heard like, man, traffic is awful. Nobody goes, I'm in traffic. I am traffic. Like somehow, every, and get, listen, and at 75 South, I get it. I don't know how any of y'all, that's why I see all the sour faces. You guys, some of you drives on 75 South today. I get it. But nobody ever, was, when we talk about church, we're always like, man, the church is full of hypocrites. The church is this. But nobody says, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's my responsibility? You know what I tell, we say it like this at our church. There is a you you haven't met yet. I don't care if you've been in church for 40 years. You ain't there yet. You ain't perfect yet. You ever hear people say, well, I'm just not that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't do that. I don't sing like that. I don't worship like that. I don't, you know. That's just how I was raised. Well, how you were raised needs a little help, bro. <laughs> Last time I saw, Jesus says we don't go from, from bad to good. We go from death to life. And to be transformed into a new creation means you are different than you were before. I'm an introvert. I don't do that stuff. Well, well guess what, Mr. Introvert, Miss Introvert, you need some help. The Holy Spirit is the one who transforms us. You are not here today because we are trying to change your behavior today. We are here today because we want to introduce you to a God who can transform your heart and your soul. And in that process, your behavior will begin to change. But when you focus on behavior first, you will always be frustrated. Because you forget that God came to transform you. To, most of us are awaiting for somebody else to be changed first before, we'll go this, before we do what we're supposed to do. You need to focus. Look at your neighbor and say, focus on you. <laughs> Easy, ladies. Not so hard. To, don't be so hard on them, Okay. <laughs> But don't miss this. Guys, this is so vital. They were called the gatekeepers for a reason. And their job was to make sure that to keep the impurities out. Can I tell you that church is not, here's, what we, here's the damage we've done with church. Is that we think that church people are supposed to be the people who are the high moral officials that are better than the rest of the world. We think this is the place where you're supposed to be perfect. And can I tell you, 
that the reason why the unchurched or the people who don't know God don't like church, maybe it's not just because you're supposed to have it all together. You're supposed to say and do all the right things. Maybe it's because you're not honest in the fact that you don't. This is not the place where you show up to be perfect and, and, and sit on your moral high horse. It's actually supposed to be designed by God, the place where you come and admit that you are not. And you confess your sin and faults to the Lord Jesus so that you can walk away being healed and transformed in his presence. But instead, we've treated church as this is the place where we come and we have it all together. And the rest of the world, because they don't go to my church, they're obviously going to hell. And that's the problem, because there's not enough authentic, vulnerable Christians to say, I'm not here today because I'm better than the person who don't know Jesus. I'm here because I met Jesus, and because of that, I realize I'm not good enough. And so in light of his righteousness, I've come today to confess those things within me that I need his help and Holy Spirit to transform me in. Are y'all with me today? Can I tell you, there's three versions of yourself, and that's the, you're like, I knew that about her. I knew that. Some of y'all are looking at him right now. That's what's wrong with you. There's three people. <laughs> but there's, there's the public you, right? I look at you right now. Everybody's behaving so good. No one's fighting or tweeting ugly things. Look at you. Some of you got the polos. You got the church gear. I love this shirt, by the way. I love it. How many of you know this looks good? I mean, you put some time and effort in, I mean, some of you, but like some of you put some time and effort in like what you look like today. But how many of those are the private you? Private you is the you that your family knows. Sometimes that's a little different. You know how I tell people that I'm successful as a pastor? It's not because how, church, how big our church gets, how many buildings we build, how many people get saved, how many people get dunked. None of that will ever dictate my success as a pastor. You know how I know that God is with me and that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do? When that woman over there will sit on the front row multiple times on a weekend to hear me speak. Because I know some pastor's wives who won't. They avoid it because they know that man on that stage is not the same man that I talked to at the house. I'm preaching today. Hey, look, some of y'all showed up today. I'm talking about cussing each other out on the way. Here. Don't look around because people will know it's you. Just go, well, pr- bless the Lord. Oh, man. Let's pray for that family. Right now, the husband's squeezing your hand, right? And you're on your way, and you're like, I will sign the papers at lunchtime if you want me to. You're young. Kids, stop screaming. Right? You ever, like, scream but tell the kids to stop screaming? Doesn't make any sense, right? But the moment you pulled up in the parking lot and you got out, you're like, Super th- hey, bless the Lord, brother. I'm so glad to be at church today. Man, we in the Psalms today? Well, bless the Lord. I can't wait to hear that song, man. It's going to speak to my heart. And you're squeezing your kid's head. Not a word to your kid's teacher. I promise you. Because this is the place where people can't know your baggage. When really this is supposed to be baggage claim area today. This is where the church, the church is baggage claim area. Come claim your baggage. Because until you own it and claim it, God can't do anything with it. It's like saying, I'm missing my luggage. And God's going, oh, I got it. It's right here. You know where it's at. You just don't want people to know it's yours. I'm preaching a lot better than y'all are letting on. So don't miss this. Are you trying to handle your own stuff without, because there's a third version of yourself. You think that's, there's the secret you. And that's the you that God knows in its fullest. It's the you that even your wife don't know about. It's the, it's, it's the late nights when you're on your phone or it's those secret conversations. It's, it's the you that you're, husband don't know about it's the you that you think if anybody knows that part of me oh they won't love me anymore they won't stick around can I tell you the reason why you feel that way is because the devil knows shame grows in the dark can I tell you that the moment that that secret you because because here's the thing the Bible says that all things done in secret will be made known one day anyways That's why you read news articles about 
moral failures. You read news articles about all this stuff. Because, and somebody, go, you ever heard somebody go, man, I never knew that about them. I never thought it would happen to them. That's because they had a secret version of themselves that you didn't know about. But can I tell you, that's the one that God loves. That's the one that God wants to address. That's the part of you that he goes, that's, you, ever, you ever told somebody, like, I don't know what came over me. You ever, you ever said that about yourself? Don't raise your hand. You ever said that about yourself? You're just like, I don't know why I acted that way. I, don't, I mean, I, I know I lost it. You ever, have, you ever see people like, whoa, they just went from zero to 100 quick. All because their coffee order got messed up. And they go like, man, I promise that's not, I don't know what came, I know what came over you, the real you. Can I tell you in moments of tension, conflict, all those things, that's when the real you comes out. Because that's the part of you that you suppress and don't let anybody else see and let anybody else in. Whew! I know it's, it's heavy. It's heavy. But I promise you, it's good. Because when you can get to this place where you realize that worship shouldn't be awkward, it should be authentic. That when I come into this place, I don't have to pretend to be somebody I'm not. But I can confess my, the, the Bible says in James, to confess your faults to one another and then you will be healed. Do you realize that you confess your sins to Jesus to be forgiven, but you confess your faults to people to be healed? I can't find wholeness and healing until I find a community of people to surround myself with where I can be vulnerable and authentic with. And it starts with understanding that is the goal of the local church. Not to create a place of a bunch of high, high and almighties and holier than thou's. And last but not least, posture. Now, do you know what posture means? I want you to look at 84.10. This is so good. 84.10, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand years anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than to live the good life in the homes of the wicked. Now, don't miss this. When he says, I'd rather be a gatekeeper, it's literally best translated is, I would rather lay down in the doorway of the church than to be anywhere else. Not even like in the cool, awesome parts of the building. He's like, man, if I could just be in the doorway and lay face down, do you realize that posture means attitudes or behavior towards something? I tell people all the time that your posture can actually do violence to people's souls. You ever try to talk to somebody and you just realize by their posture they're not receiving what you have to say? And they're not listening and they don't want to listen? I mean, I think it's part of the problem that we have in our nation and our culture is that we have a posture of I don't want to understand or have empathy of anything that you're going through. Because really we don't care about people's souls. We just care about being right. But a posture goes, God, change my attitude and behavior toward your presence and toward your people. Because without posture, I can't experience both to the fullest. But if we're being honest, we really love for God to fix our problems, but not our posture. Many times we want God to fix our problems on our posture. In fact, that's why you came to church. You got some issues. You want God to take care of it, and God's going, I realize you're asking. You ever had your kid be rude when they ask for something? Hey, yo, Dad, three donuts now, or I'm out. And you're like, if you grew up like me, I mean, my mother believed on the laying on of hands, but it wasn't like in a spiritual way. Like, if I'd have said that to my mama, three days later, I'm waking up in a coma. You know what I'm saying? Like, what just happened? They used to say things, I'm going to knock you back in the next, into, into the last week, right? I've lived several weeks twice. But anyways, like, <laughs> but posture is this realizing, like, man, do I realize who, I'm, who I've come to see today? Do I realize who I've come to pray to today? You see, their posture, even though they were enslaved and, and been exiled and they were far away from the presence of God according to, the, to what they believed where God dwelled and they had a posture of humility. They had a posture of desperation, brokenness, worship, authentic. Because some of us think that, man, if I tell God what I really think, 
that somehow he's going to be appalled. Can I tell you, can I go ahead and set you free today? He already knows what you think. And so it's the, it's the attitudes and behaviors of our hearts and how we approach Jesus. And it's really this understanding of like, man, if I, if I want to really have a heart for this house, and I want us to go to the last, last statement. I'm going to get out of your hair in just a moment. The last statement I want you to see is this. We must develop a heart for worship in this house of God because we would love to worship the God of this house. It's, that's my posture. And our posture, it's, it's hard because so many of us are so used to the comfort and apathy that we've grown up in. Maybe you have your preconceived ideas. and that's, uh, This isn't in my notes, but I want to give you a fourth one. This is, this is bonus material. This is extra credit. So not only do we need to focus on the presence of God, the people of God, and our posture toward God, but it starts with our perspective of God. And can I tell you, when, I came, when y'all came in, I was watching y'all, and it was cute. I was watching you guys carry in your little shoeboxes. You're like, I don't see anybody with a shoebox. It's a metaphor. But you did, most of you. And you can tell through some people's worship. You can tell through, because I get it. Like, some people are like, well, I'm more of a reflective worshiper. And that's true. Some people are. But I don't think this is reflective worship. I think this is a posture of hard-heartedness, callousness, and pride. I don't expect everybody to worship the same and lift their hands or sing or dance, but can I be honest? Most of you will worship according to the way that you have put God in your box. And you've come in with your pre- preconceived ideas of who God is, hadn't you? You already know what to expect. I was raised, I was raised Catholic. I know what to expect from God. I always tell, I love our church. Our church is filled with recovering Catholics, Baptists, Church of Christ, Methodists. It's awesome. Because at some point, most of you, and there's nothing wrong with those denominations inherently, but if, if your only view of God is based off of religion, but not the God of the universe, then you're already going to write your own story without letting God have the pen. If you ever have somebody go, that's the story of my life. I didn't really expect God to do anything anyways. I mean, I'll pray about it. You guys can pray for me, but I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Those are people who are walking around with their shoebox with God in it. You know why? Because we love to be certain, don't we? We love it. In fact, our brains are almost hardwired in a way like you get pleasure from being right. Like we, we are almost wired to finish each other's sentences. How many of you are saying sentences, right? You're like, I, I got, because it brings you pleasure to complete it. You ever talk to somebody that won't let you talk? They just keep trying to say what you're trying to say. Do you realize that every time you take a step, your brain gets pleasure because it feels certainty when it steps, that the ground is there and it's going to hold me up. That's why when you trip, your brain goes haywire because it's like, I didn't see that coming, Right? Can I tell you, that's what a lot of your life and your faith and your journey looks like? Here's what it looks like. Okay, I made it through college. I finally got the spouse. I got the house. I got the dog. We're pregnant, and then we miscarriage. I didn't see that coming. Are you walked with certainty down the aisle with that certain someone, and all of a sudden, three years later, you didn't see the affair. Maybe you're walking through certainty with life and we have a, a couple in our church, Miss Lindsay Roberts. And I wish I would share this story at the 930. Um, I don't know if you know how old Lindsay is, do you, babe? 20, yeah, mid-20s. I met her and John. They had a little girl, Rachel, year old sweetest couple you're talking about the softest heart humble 
he was one of our uh, musicians in our worship band. And when this guy played, it's ironic. Man, this is such a God thing. But, but Jay, you guys sing the goodness of God. That was the last song he ever played guitar to on our stage. Because in November of 2020, he was um, up cutting limbs near power lines and he got electrocuted and fell out of the bucket and was killed. One year old girl leaves his wife to pick up all these pieces. How many of you know they didn't see that coming? Some of you are walking, but man, you've, you've tried to stay healthy, you've done all these things, and then you get the cancer diagnosis. Maybe in the last two years, you've lost a loved one that you didn't see coming. And here's what I know is that so many of us, maybe we're angry or we're filled with doubt. You know why? Can I tell you? It's because we are people of certainty who worship a God that is a mystery. And some of you need to let him out of your box today. And realize my job on this earth is not to figure out every single reason why. But it is to worship this God. Oh, man, if I will change my perspective to like, God, you move however you want to in my life. You fill my heart and my soul with your Holy Spirit. And help, God, help me to respond to you in a form of worship that is authentic and real. God, I don't understand everything, but I do know there are at least two promises that I know of. And one is that, that if I bring my sin to him, the Bible promises that the, because of the blood of Jesus and his sacrifice, it will cover my sins and they will be forgiven and forgotten. And the next big promise is not that everything will work out in this life, but it is that, man, when I surrender my soul to him, he will transform me into a new creation so that I might be prepared to walk through a valley of weeping. Because let me tell you something. How will we ever be refreshed if we're never thirsty? And our problem is, is that we are so drunk on our own food that we place in our lives. And it's our entertainment. It's our own selfishness. It's our own desires. It's our own materials. It's our own lusts. And I'm going to tell you something. You'll never hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God if you're already full of everything else. Because now I realize when I change my perspective of who he is, it helps me anticipate his presence and surround myself with God's people. And in turn, it breaks down my posture. Father, I pray for every single person in this room right now. God, because somebody needs to be encouraged right here in this moment. Every head bowed, every eye closed. But if you're here today and you say, man, I'm in that season of uncertainty right now. My life feels like I've stumbled and I'm falling and I'm out of control and I just, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Would you just be authentic in this place and lift your hand and say, I need prayers today. And just say, I, I feel my feet coming out from under me. God bless you. Hands going up. God bless you. Father, I pray for those hands right now. God, there are people that their footing has been shaken beneath them. But God, I, I just hold on to the truth of your word that you tell us that even when our feet slip from the rocks, you're there to catch us. But even though I may fall into the deepest, darkest of pit, Psalm 40 reminds me you have placed my feet upon the rock and you've put a new song in my mouth. I pray that we would approach the Psalms differently, that, God, we would have that same desperation in this moment. God, I don't have certainty where my next step will be, but I know who guides them. And so, Lord, for every person that lifted their hands, I pray that, first of all, they have a relationship with you where they can place their trust in you, that their sins are covered, and that their soul is protected by your presence, by your people, by our posture. Move in this place. Move in this place, Holy Spirit. Bring comfort. Bring peace. Bring joy. I pray this in Jesus' name.